E tuku hōna re ki te matua te tama te wairua tapu me ngā ane ra pono me te māngai, hei tau toko mai, ae ne, āke ne, āmene. E ngā mate kua mene atu ki te pō, au e te mamai, au e te hotu. E ngā mate katoa, haere, haere, haere atu rā, āpati honno, tātai honno, rātau ki a rātau, tātau ki a tātau, a tēnā no tātau katoa. Welcome to everyone to this fourth lecture series in a series of 10 lectures. Last month we heard from Dr. Martin Fisher on the seven generation struggle of Te Kremi from 1849 to 1985. Now we move into a period of time uh, where we lodged our Ngaitahu claim to Kremi, uh, Y27, uh, in front of the Waitangi Tribunal. This lecture series is about the hearings uh, we put before the Waitangi Tribunal and its final report. Again, Dr Martin Fisher will be your lecturer and presenter for today. Tēnā koe, Martin. Kia ora tātou katoa. Uh, haere mai, uh, welcome back to the Te Kereme and Naitahu Settlement Workshop series, looking at Waitangi Tribunal hearings and reports. We can see this image uh, here from this cover photo of the porphyry taking place at Tuahiwi from the very first hearings. And these are very important because this is the first time that Naitahu is truly heard by the Crown. And the findings that are made uh, in these reports that come out of these hearings have a very strong bearing on the redress, the settlements uh, that result. And that's obviously something that we'll be focused on for the rest of the workshop series, but also for us to, to pause and recognize this important cathartic moment for Naitahu, just like others um, around the Motu, when they have these Waitangi tribunal hearings. It's a time when the crown is finally forced to sit and listen, listen to the claimants uh, and hear the pain that has, has resulted from this intergenerational trauma. So what we'll do today is we'll, we'll first off have a look at the Naitahu Māori Trust Board, which as we learned in the last workshop was uh, one of the products of the 1944 settlement. And so we'll just have a, a little bit of a look at what role it played in bringing the claim to the Waitangi Tribunal uh, and, and who it represented and who it was made up of. We'll also look at the background to the establishment of the Waitangi Tribunal. It's important for us to understand where it came from, what were its initial limitations, as originally it could only look at contemporary claims, and it was only until 1985 that it finally got the powers to investigate historical claims. So we'll look at some of the background and the involvement of Naitahu uh, Tatsipine in bringing these new amendments to the legislation which created the Waitangi Tribunal to allow these historical claims. And we'll also look at some of the important court cases which fed into the eventual provision of binding powers where the Waitangi Tribunal, during Naitahu's hearings, during the late 1980s, uh, was giving these very strong powers to force the Crown to return certain lands and assets um, that at least had these powers, although as we'll see, it hasn't used these. And particularly for Naitahu, we'll explore uh, in a future workshop, Naita, who struggles with this. We'll then turn to Naita, whose experiences themselves, having an overview of the hearings, some of the submissions and evidence given by Naita, who finally. And then we'll turn to the four Watangi Tribunal reports that were produced for the Naita, who claim for Takeremi. The very first 1991 Naita, who land report easily the largest of the reports and, and perhaps the most important. Uh, the very small 1992 report on legal personality, then the 1992 report on sea fisheries claims, and finally the 1995 ancillary claims report. 
So we've got a fair bit of ground to cover. Uh, you can see there's a number of reports that were, were released to address the Naitahu claim, and certainly Naitahu benefited uh, from having this strong determinations and findings on their claims uh, by the tribunal. So let's move on to uh, Naitahu Māori Trust Board. Uh, but also just a reminder, uh, if you haven't done so, to turn off your mics and um, turn off your cameras. And if you have any issues, just reach out to tech support in the chat, please. So the Naitahu Māori Trust Board, established first in theory in 1928, when the Crown was still trying to determine what kind of settlements it would provide. So despite the fact that there was some legislation which created it in 1928, it does not sit until the mid 1940s and following Naitahu's first half a loaf settlement as we described it in the previous workshop, this 1944 settlement. In 1946, we have the Naitahu Trust Board Act is passed. And then in 1955, the Māori Trust Boards Act creates um, uniform legislation for all Māori trust boards across the country. And the Naitahu Māori Trust Board is also taken under uh, within, that, within that grouping. But the trust board exists from 1946 to 1996. And although it was meant to be the final product of the claim from the point of view of the crown, just like the 1997, 1998 settlement is uh, full and final according to the clauses contained within the deed of settlement and the settlement legislation, the 1944 settlement was also meant to be a full and final settlement from the point of view once again solely of the crown. So it was maybe a little bit ironic that the trust board becomes the vehicle for carrying Takademi forward, in addition with obviously the communities on the ground, the marae based communities um, around the Naitahu Rohe. But in, in many ways, the trust board does become uh, this vehicle for pushing it forward. So what was the Naitahu Māori Trust Board? Well, it was essentially created to administer that annual endowment of 10,000 pounds per year. If you remember, initially the 354,000 recommended payment in 1920, by the time it gets to 1944, is reduced to only 30,000 pounds, and that's paid out over 30 years. And you'll remember this amount very quickly eroded with inflation. Now, in 1967, it was converted to $20,000 when we switched to the dollar and decimalization. But it was still very, very much far, far less uh, than the value even set out in 1944. And we'll talk about in a future workshop that the Crown finally admits this in the late 1980s. And some seven to eight million dollars in back pay is provided to the Naitahu Māori Trust Board, and as well as uh, the Tainui and Taranaki Māori Trust Boards as well, who had similar 1940s era settlements. Nonetheless, even with this small amount of money, there were still scholarships provided, um, trying to get the money out into the community as small as it was, and as well as a eventually purchasing some flats in Wellington to provide at least a little bit of cash flow. And this would begin the process of trying to fund the negotiations and really fund the taking of the claim to the tribunal. Very differently from the current setup of Terunanga o Naitahu, the Naitahu Māori Trust Board had seven seats. Uh, rather than the 18 that we know of today for the different Papa Tsukurunanga. The different constituencies were Kaikoura, and we can see here in this 1977 version of the Naitahu Māori Trust Board, we have Bill Solomon uh, representing Kaikoura, Mahunui representing Canterbury and West Coast, Akahia Tau Senior, as we'll see, the 
original names claimant for the claim to the Waitangi Tribunal, out of Fenua representing South Canterbury and North Otago, uh, here represented by Bill Torepe, who was the chairman, Akaroa representing Banks Peninsula, Morris Pohio, Araita Uru for Otago, um, here with Bill Ellison, and Murihiku Bob Whitey. Now, finally, there is a, a difference with the Terunanga or Naitahu setup that there was a North Island seat, the Teika Maui seat here held uh, by Tiffany O'Regan, who would later become the chairman. So some, some slight different changes um, in what would eventually become Terunanga, certainly. So let's move into discussing establishment of the Waitangi Tribunal. It was established in 1975 through the Treaty of Waitangi Act. This was uh, brought forward to Parliament, obviously, as a bill by the Minister of Māori Affairs and Northern MP, Matthew Rata. Now, this original version of the Waitangi Tribunal was slightly limited in terms of the kinds of claims it could investigate. Rata had a very difficult job. Even though this was a Labour government, the third Labour government, there was still a whole lot of conservatism uh, within that cabinet. And so it was impossible to have the tribunal able to investigate historical claims, right, dating back to uh, 1840, February 6th. And so this initial Watangi tribunal could only investigate contemporary claims, that is, claims after the passage of the act, so after 1975. Rata had attempted to have it go back to 1900, but he couldn't even get that. So forget 1840. Nonetheless, was a, this was an important uh, starting block. And there were a number of influential reports that emerged mainly around environmental issues. We had the Motunui Waitara Report, in 1983, Kaituna River in 1984, and Manukau Harbor in 1985, all related to environmental claims. Important from this first iteration of the Waitangi Tribunal was this was the first legislation which instructed a commission of inquiry to consider both versions of the treaty, the English version and the Maori version. And so this was truly a precedent setting aspect of the, of the legislation and made the tribunal very much what it was today and built on creating some principles, drawing on both versions of the treaty, especially in those early reports. Now, as some of you may have already known, in 1984, the prime minister, Robert Muldoon, gets incredibly drunk one day and calls a snap election. He could have maintained his government. One of his MPs crossed the aisle, um, could have been in a state of inebriation. Uh, it could have been just pure vanity. But for whatever reason, massive changes were to occur as a result of that election uh, that National lost in a landslide to Labour. Huge revolutionary changes to our economy, um, and really to our social system in many ways as well, would occur as a result of this election and our shift into the fourth Labour government. Importantly for us, and what we're considering right now in terms of the Waitangi Tribunal, Tiffany O'Regan was a part of the Thorndon branch of the Labour Party. And if anybody's been to Wellington, they know Thorndon is right around Victoria University of Wellington. Um, so very much a student-focused branch of the Labour Party. And it was here that as Tatipani tells it in the dead of night, that a policy platform uh, for Labour's platform was introduced, that there should be an amendment to the Treaty of Waitangi Act to allow the tribunal to investigate historical claims. Uh, the president of that branch was Michael Hirschfeld, and this was put through, and it was added to the Labour uh, platform for this election. And when they won in a landslide, in it went. The Treaty of Waitangi Amendment Act passed in 1985, this time brought forward by the Minister of Māori Affairs and the fourth Labour government, 
Korowetre. And we can see there as well, Prime Minister David Longy and another important Māori cabinet minister, uh, Peter Lands, who was Minister of Lands, um, Peter Tassel, who was Minister of Lands for a lot of that government. Now, the Treaty of Waitangi Amendment Act opened up the Pandora's box, so to speak. The Crown had no idea what it was doing. It was certainly for the benefit of Māori to, to have that situation, that so much was going on, that the politicians didn't really realise what was happening. Now, the tribunal was going to be able to investigate claims going all the way back to February 6, 1840. This opened the way for historical claims and eventually settlements as well. Now, in addition, it also expanded the type of claims which could be investigated. Not only actions of the Crown, but also omissions of the Crown. So what the Crown did not do to create treaty breaches for Māori. This also greatly increased and multiplied um, the number of different uh, claims that would be possible. And slowly the claims began to trickle in. And certainly Naitahu was one of the first. Now, there were also some important changes which we need to understand and recognize as we move forward into the hearings and then on into the Naitahu settlement. And this was a really seminal court case which took place and was a uh, judgment was delivered in 1987 by the Court of Appeal. That was the New Zealand Māori Council versus Attorney, Attorney General case, often known as the Lance case. This forced the Crown to halt the transfer of state-owned enterprise assets that could in theory be privatized and then never be available for Māori in some future settlement. We were nowhere near even a settlement process. Lord Robin Cook of Thorndon, who we can see there, was the president of the Court of Appeal. But it was a unanimous decision uh, by the entire Court of Appeal in, in favor of the New Zealand Māori Council, backed up by Naitahu Māori Trust Board, Tainui Māori Trust Boards, and many others. And essentially forced the Crown to negotiate with quote unquote Māori to figure out some kind of protection mechanisms so that when a settlement is one day negotiated for different groups, that there will be these crown assets available because private property was gonna be completely unavailable and off the books. The result was the Treaty of Waitangi State Enterprises Act 1988. And this provided these binding powers for the Waitangi Tribunal over state-owned enterprise assets. And it meant that there were memorials placed on these land titles so that if somebody wanted to buy this piece of land, was planning to privatize, it was no longer required for the Crown, the person buying it would know that if one day a well-founded claim was made by the Waitangi Tribunal and an application was made to return this by some claimants, it could be purchased back compulsorily by the Crown. So this was incredibly important to provide some new powers beyond just those powers of recommendation that the Waitangi Tribunal had. Now, in addition to the state-owned enterprises assets, we also get similar litigation related to the privatization of the Crown's forests, mainly commercial pine that had been planted at various stages during the 20th century. Huge, huge resources. We have some of the largest pine plantations in the entire Southern Hemisphere here in Aotearoa. And this also led to a piece of legislation, the Crown Forest Assets Act, 1989. And similarly, there were binding powers given to the Waitangi Tribunal in which it could force the crown to return certain crown forest lands. And it also collected rentals to be placed into a new trust called the Crown Forestry Rental Trust. And this trust would hold these rentals, which is essentially forestry companies renting the land to grow their trees and make their profits, and these rentals were set aside by the Crown to eventually be used in settlement. And we'll see Naitahu had some Crown Force rentals as a part of its settlement. 
But once again, you had these binding powers for the return of these lands, these rentals, and also some financial compensation. As we'll explore in the Naitaku settlement negotiations, far, far bigger than any of the direct negotiated settlements that the Crown was offering. So we can see the Watangi Tribunal begins as this very limited uh, institution that can only investigate contemporary claims. It then had the power to investigate historical claims and eventually even provided with binding powers. And it's within this context that Naitahu had their Waitangi Tribunal claims. So let's break out for our first 10 minute session. And here are some of the um, patai, some of the questions for us to consider. Now remember to please turn on your mics, turn on your cameras and join the breakout rooms when it comes up. Please um, appoint one person uh, within your group once you've introduced yourselves to each other uh, to provide some feedback. It can be comments. It doesn't have to be questions. It can be as well, just important things that have come up um, out of them as, as a, we've set out here in these questions. So how many constituencies were there in the original Naitahu Māori Trust Board and how did this differ from Trant? Why was it so important to the Iwi's Waitangi Tribunal claim? What is the Waitangi Tribunal? What is this permanent commission of inquiry? How did its first iteration established in 75 differ from that set up in 1985? And how does it have binding powers in relation to state-owned enterprise and crown forest assets? Kia ora, we'll see you soon. So we've had one question from a group. So please others um, get in questions, comments, uh, anything that comes up. Um, that you find sort of interesting or, or really sticks out to you. There's no kind of bad comments. It's just about um, getting different kinds of feedback around. Well, we do have a couple coming in here. So kia ora, uh, to those groups. We had one question saying, please help us understand the reasons for North Island representation within the Naitahu Māori Trust Board. An excellent question that I was hoping somebody would bring up. I didn't want to put it specifically into the questions there. So I'm glad that it did stick out to a group there. I think at the time, the argument was made that, you know, as a result um, of migrations uh, away from the heartlands, that there were so many people uh, living in the North Island and I think there was even some debate when Terunanga or Naitahu was being established was should there once again be uh, a North Island sort of representative seat? I, I think, and I could be corrected on this, eventually, you know, the decision was made that people should reconnect to their marae based communities, you know, which would eventually become the Papa Terunangas. Um, but because of you know, not only the post-World War II migrations, you know, many people were migrating even prior to that, certainly, um, all around to different parts of the country. So that was the reason for it. I mean, up to you guys whether you think that was a good or bad idea. Uh, but certainly, you know, Tatipani became the chairman, and, and often um, the North Island seat would have uh, the chairmanship as well for the trust board. So representing um, some of the importance of that at the time. So kia ora for that question. I hope that's a little bit of an answer for you. Now we have another question about how a Waitangi Tribunal claims um, regarding um, SOE assets binding, whereas recommendations to government are not binding. So it's just basically through different um, parts of the legislation, the Treaty of Waitangi Act that governs the Waitangi Tribunal. And it's all under the same, um, I believe it's section six and section eight. And, you know, the recommendations that are made are a part of that um, 
Section 6 aspect of the legislation. And under Section 8, these new powers given in relation to SOE assets and Crown Force assets, once again, never been used. Um, there's actually a case um, going through right now. There was interim recommendation binding orders made for um, lands around Turangi in 1998, but these were actually not followed through with because they're interim orders. They're only 90-day interim orders, and after that 90 day, do they become final? So these binding recommendations, you know, have been described as this sort of sword of Damocles, right? This this pressure over the crown, the tiniest little bit of leverage that claimants have in this kind of a process. Eventually, this is what pushes the crown to begin direct negotiations. It does not want the courts and the tribunal to be in charge of this stuff. The crown obviously believes, and it is generally the sovereign. It controls um, this country, you know, whether we like it or not. So that was the difference between these recommendations um, and these binding recommendations, uh, and they're much more difficult to acquire. Currently, the Manga II Incorporation, as well as some claimant groups on the east coast of the North Island, sort of north of Gisborne, um, have just got some interim orders for the return of some Crown Force assets, compensation, uh, and rentals. Caught up in the courts, the Crown will appeal them till the cows come home. And so this is the challenge that comes with it. And we'll see also for night time. Couple of other questions or, or some feedback also around the North Island rep. They're saying, was this because we needed to have someone who knew how the politics worked? You could say that. Um, certainly, Tatipani um, very much knew how Wellington worked. And um, why did this drop off? I can't exactly tell you. Uh, but I'll, I'll try and look into it um, some more for when we come up to our Te Runanga o uh, lecture that will be strictly about the struggle to have um, Terunanga established. Final, final uh, comment. One group discussed the original seven seats versus the 18 currently, uh, which we thought was province-based versus iwi-based, which really opened up the depth and breadth of claims. I mean, I think it was a great idea, certainly, to expand the number. You know, seven was not going to be nearly enough. Um, and taking it up uh, 218, we can see there was only one Murihiku seat, and you can see all the Papa Tepurunanga that exist um, in the south. Same with Mahunui. I think there are six seats um, going all the way down to Tamutu. I could be wrong there, um, but perhaps also taking in Arofenua. So some huge, huge changes, and we'll talk some more about this when we get to the establishment of Tepurunanga on night of it. Thank you so much for that feedback comments and questions, keep them coming in. Let's continue on then now with our next section, looking at the Waitangi Tribunal's arrival into Te Waiponama. And also please uh, just turn off your uh, mics and cameras if you haven't done so. And then if you do um, have any issues, once again, uh, through to tech support in the chat. So this Waitangi Tribunal finally arrives into Te Waipono. And I meant to say in the previous session, Waitangi Tribunal is this permanent commission of inquiry. And it's important to understand you know, what that is. A commission of inquiry is essentially when there is a disaster and the Crown needs to figure out what has occurred. We've had a number of commissions of inquiry recently uh, in relation to Pike River, um, and as well as the earthquakes, obviously, here in Christchurch, and I believe even a commission of inquiry into the horrific um, Christchurch attacks from 2019. One day, we will definitely have a commission of inquiry into the COVID response, too. So these are some of these different kinds of disasters that we can think about. So what's the disaster that the Waitangi Tribunal is investigating? Well, it's the colonization of this country and its status as a permanent commission of inquiry uh, is really important as a venue for Māori, 
the cost is not like the courts. It's not like taking it to the district courts or the high court or the court of appeal or God forbid, the Supreme Court. So the Watanga Tribunal is this really important entity. I don't know whether it's uh, fallen under um, the sort of scrap heap that ACT has released for its alternative budget, um, wanting to scrap anything in sight. Um, but the Waitangi Tribunal occasionally comes up for discussion like this, but if there was any attempts to get rid of it, there would certainly be an enormous blowback from Māori and, and from Pākehā, I think, from any Pākehā as well. So when this permanent commission of inquiry finally arrives in Te, te, te Wai Ponamu for the first time in 1987 for Naitahu's hearings, they take place from 1987 to 1989, a total of 26 weeks of hearings right across the Rohe. And I believe there is one or two held as well in Te Whanganui Atara in, in Wellington at the Waitangi Tribunal's headquarters. This was incredibly important to have these hearings within the Naitahu Rohe themselves on some of the marae of Naitahu. Obviously, I mentioned previously, and we saw the photo of the first arrival of the tribunal in the Porfiri taking place at Tuahiwi, at Mahanui the first, uh, the first Farinui. We have Mahanui, obviously, the second, which exists at Tuahiwi today. But you also had hearings taking place all over the Rohe, at Otako, at Awarua, at Te Rao Aroha, uh, in Bluff, at, on the West Coast, to Taipotini. And it's very important for these claims to be heard from within the communities themselves, certainly for the claimant evidence. Because what you get in these hearings is a commission of inquiry is like a court, but it's obviously not a court. It's governed by different legislation, the Commissions of Inquiry Act 1908, but it's very similar. The claimants present their evidence. The Crown presents its evidence. You also have third parties that can become um, a part of the inquiry as well and present their own evidence as well. And this kind of process means that when you have these hearings within the home territories of the claimants, it provides an opportunity for the community to, to be there to hear these claims and to deal with the sort of catharsis that's necessary, right? Going through and dealing with the pain that comes from this seven, eight generation struggle. Now for the Crown evidence, this was also um, heard within, sometimes within the Marae communities as well, but often it was, it was held still within the South Island, um, but at high schools, uh, conference centers, and um, in these kinds of areas as well. Now, not only Naitahu is there, but obviously, importantly, the Crown is there to be forced to listen to Naitahu's claims. We've talked previously about other commissions of inquiry. Obviously, we have the 1921 that feeds into the 1944 settlement. We've talked about the Smith Nairn Commission of 1880-1881 um, as well in the previous workshop. But in none of these was the Crown really forced to sit there and listen and put its own resources into responding to the claims of Naito. So although Naitahu Fanui had obviously been carrying this claim with them for many, many years and knew about their claims. This was something new for the Crown to really sit and listen. Now, it also had a uniting effect for Naitahu, just like um, fighting the Crown um, throughout that seven generation struggle, and just like the ways that Nazi Tor and the invasions that occurred here in the pre-treaty era brought Naitahu together. Because these claims in many ways were separate claims made from the different communities 
made from the different hapu and different areas around the Naitahurohe. And so it can be very much a uniting factor too. So they were educating the crown. They were also equally educating North Island Māori. North Island Māori were clueless about tekereni. There could all, often be sort of derogatory ways in which North Island Māori spoke about Nantahu. And so this was very much an education process uh, for those as well. And we'll see some important um, members of the Waitangi Tribunal. And you also had interest in Pākehā involved, conservation interest, something we'll touch on in quite a bit of detail when it comes to the treaty settlement. The seafood industry, very much so in relation to the sea fisheries claims. Farming interests, federated farmers actually became a huge ally of Naitahu, which might surprise some. The conservationists, massive opponents, farmers, huge allies, who would have guessed? And you also had the arrival of Māori from Te Ihu, from the top of the south, and the cross claims that would arise. On the very first day at Tuahiwi, a number of groups under the banner of the Kudahopo Waka Trust. So you had a whole bunch of different parties involved, and it was quite the scene uh, when the Waitangi Tribunal finally arrived. Now, as I said, there's many different claims that were made, but as Rakihia pointed out in the opening, they were all organized around the Y27 claim, which was the first and original claim submitted by uh, Rakahia's father, Rakahia Tau Sr., who was the deputy chairman of the Naitahu Māori Trust Board at that time in 1986, when the first claims were submitted. In relation to the privatization of state-owned enterprise assets, these SOEs that we just talked about before, and in 1987, prior to the hearing, amendments were made um, to widen the, you know, the different kinds of claims. Y27 just refers to basically the order in which the claim numbers are assigned by the tribunal itself. And that's where Y27 comes from. So although there were many other claims, they all organized themselves around this Y27. And we can see there in that photo of Rakahi Tau Senior there with Bob Faitiri uh, at one of the hearings in 1988. Now the tribunal panel was also an impressive array of personalities and skills. And Naitahu certainly benefited from this, yes, this quite impressive group of people. So there's one Waitangi tribunal, but it's important to recognize that all the hearings that take place are heard by different panels, different groups. All of the Māori land court judges are also presiding officers for Waitangi tribunal hearings. So they're appointed as sort of the head of the hearing. And for Naitahu, it was Judge Ashley McHugh. But there's also a tribunal panel, obviously made up of the members. Today, there's 20 members. They all have to be half Māori and half Pākehā. They are komatua, historian, legal experts, tikanga experts, business backgrounds, all over the place. And the tribunal members was an amazing group for Naitahu. You had Bishop Manuhuya Bennett, uh, Georgina Tehuhu, who would later become an MP and a national cabinet minister, um, Sir Hugh Kafaru, very famous Oxford legal scholar, Sir Monita Delamere was a Māori incorporation manager with knowledge about uh, Māori land matters, and you also had some very important knowledgeable Pākehā, Professor Gordon Orr and Sir Desmond Sullivan. So quite an all-star group here. So following these 26 weeks of hearings, we get a report produced in, to be honest, a pretty short amount of time, especially considering how long it takes these days. It was only about a year and a half after the conclusion of the hearings that we get the release of the first of four reports in February, 1991. The Naitahu Land Report 
easily the largest of any of the reports related to the Naitaku claims. It was also published as the Naitaku report in different places. So if you see it as the Naitaku report um, as well, but you can see here, this version was the Naitaku land report. And it really you know, is emblematic of what this was focused on. It was generally focused on the Fenua and certainly the reserves and issues that arose out of that. This report was the longest at the time, a little bit over 1,300 pages. It has far been exceeded uh, these days. I believe the Te Uruwebeta report um, comes out at about 10 or 11 volumes, over 10,000 pages. But at this time, certainly Naitahus was one of the first tribal-based inquiries. You had much smaller inquiries taking place. You had Nazi Fatua or Orake, their report released in 1987, but Naitahus was certainly the largest at the time. And it found overwhelmingly in Naitahus' favor in relation to the nine tall trees. So you remember we discussed those as the 10 land purchases, become effectively eight when we put the three Banks Peninsula purchases as one. And then those are the eight tall trees with the ninth tall tree being the restrictions on access to Mahinga Kai. And so the tribunal reports on all of these land purchases, Mahinga Kai, as well as the promises of schools and hospitals, finds in Naitahu's favor, certainly on that and Mahinga Kai, um, also discussing the perpetual leasing regime, which uh, was instituted on Tatsai on the West Coast, especially the Mafeta lands, very much finds the Naitaho's favorite there, um, and even discuss some of the previous attempts at settlement commissions of inquiry, and roundly condemns the 1944 settlement as, as nowhere near adequate or accepted by all of Naitaho. And we can see there from one of its conclusions that the tribunal cannot avoid conclusion that in acquiring from Naitahu 34 million acres, more than half the landmass of New Zealand for 14,850 pounds and leaving them with only 35,757 acres, the Crown acted unconscionably and in repeated breach of the Treaty of Waitangi. And as a consequence, Naitahu has suffered grave injustices over more than 140 years. The tribe is clearly entitled to very substantial redress from the Crown. Although the tribunal finds in Naitahu's favor overall, though, not all the claims are upheld. And this, as we'll see, feeds directly into the treaty settlement negotiations. And it shows the importance of findings from the Waitangi Tribunal. Most notably, the tribunal did not find in Naitahu's favor in relation to the tenth claim at Otago. And you remember we went through that a couple workshops ago. The claim that the New Zealand company, which was originally meant to be the settlers provided for the Otago purchase, provides these tents around the country. We know they've got them in Nelson and Wellington and in New Plymouth. And in this case, despite the fact that the Smith Nairn Commission found in Naitahu's favor in relation to tents way back in 1881, over a hundred years later, the Waitangi Tribunal privileges contemporary written evidence from Europeans, from British, over the oral testimony of Naitahu at the 1880-81 Smith Nairn Commission. So they relied on the written evidence from the 1840s, from the time of the actual Crown purchase. This is something certainly unique. The public generally, people always consider, all oh, the Watanga Tribunal just approves all claims that come to it. We can see very clearly here that they did not, and they privileged the written record. And we'll see how that played in very strongly into some key early negotiations between Naitahu and the Crown. But this is where the tribunal 
very much was having its cake and eating it too. Because although it rejected the claim in the Otago Purchase, later in the report, it states that had the Crown reserved one-tenth of all of Naitahu's land purchases, it would have been greatly to the benefit of Naitahu. That's what Naitahu uses in the negotiation, and certainly the Crown uses the findings against the specific purchase. Now, the tribunal also rejected Naitahu's claims to the hole in the middle, that they hadn't sold the main divide, and also the claims to having not sold Fjordland in the Murihiku purchase. So we can see some key aspects of the Naitahu claim, although overall, 100% the Crown uh, the tribunal finds in Naitahu's favor, we can see some key aspects of the claim that aren't. Both the Crown and Naitahu have their concerns with the report, but obviously are instructed, and it's in the best of both of their interests, to set them aside when they move into the negotiation. But each uses the report in different ways to its own benefit. Now, there's excellent evidence produced by both sides and I apologize for this relatively uh, terrible photo here, but this is a picture of all of the Naitahu evidence. On the top there is the claimant evidence, and those two rows below, you can see thousands and thousands of pages of crown evidence as well. And so all of this evidence is what goes in to this final report. And you can multiply this across the country. There is an amazing amount of historical material that has been produced for this process and, and one that will hopefully be used um, by students and, and just interested people as we move on into the future. Now, the hearings here and the cross-examination were a little bit more inquisitorial rather than adversarial. That's what I'm trying to mean there is we have some hearings taking place beforehand in Murifenua in the top of the north and even in Taranaki a few years later very adversarial, very harsh. Doesn't mean that the Crown wasn't cross-examining Naitahu evidence and witnesses, but there was far more of a, a push to get at the truth. And some of the Crown researchers, quite young at the time, would later become very prominent claimant historians. Um, some of the Crown researchers, including David Armstrong, Bruce Sterling, uh, David Alexander, Tony Wazel, uh, you had a Canadian in there as well, who I should mention, Donald Loveridge, although he remained a Crown historian for a very long time. And then the Naitahu researchers, uh, also a very strong group. A young Jim McAloon, who's currently professor of history at Victoria University of Wellington. Ann Parsonson, emeritus professor at Canterbury and currently a member of the Waitangi Tribunal. Uh, Harry Everson, obviously, who we've heard about before. And then Naitahu members as well, Trevor House and Athel Anderson. Very interestingly, there was a father-son duo on each side, Anne Parsonson for Naitahu, and her father, Gordon Parsonson, was presenting evidence on the Otago tents, the same issue. So you had this daughter-father, not clash, but um, kind of mix on each of the different sides. Now, the tribunal also commissioned its own research. Um, Peter Tremewin on Banks Peninsula, he was a, a lecturer in French studies. Alan Ward, Professor Alan Ward, who provided an overview of the evidence, and George Habib on Mahinga Kai and especially sea fisheries. Now, before we break out, I also just wanted to go through um, the list of Naitahu people who had provided evidence as well, because those were our sort of professional historian evidence. But you also get Tangata Fenua evidence, submissions from individuals. And this is an important legacy as well, something that can be used for, for many, many decades to come. We had evidence from Tsefari Tutu Sterling, Rangi Marie to Maiharoa, um, Aroha Rediti Crofts, Eduera to Aika. Tiffany O'Regan, Emma Gruby Phillips, obviously Dr. Hiatau Sr., um, Tamari Tau, Kua Langsbury, uh, the Ellisons, Edward, Matt, and George, uh, Andrew Mason and Kelly Wilson, Sandra Lee, 
Erie Barber, Dorothy Frazier, uh, James and Alan Russell, Bob Feitzhitty, Sidney Cormack, Harold Ashwell, George Tate, oh, uh, Widow Davis, Tati Bradshaw, uh, Jane Davis, Ta'ohudai Waka, Lena Fowler, David Higgins, Bill Solomon, Donald and Kath Brown, and Kelvin Anglum, Kelvin Tamidi, and Widemu Torepi. I just wanted to put those names out there. And this evidence is available on Karyao, um, this amazing Naitahu archive. So if those names pique an interest for you, whether it's for your own fauna or something else that you've seen, please do go have a look at them. So let's break out again now. Please, uh, yeah, turn on your mics, turn on your cameras, and discuss what was most notable to you about the Iwi's Waitangi Tribunal hearings. And anything, please, can come out of there. And did the Waitangi Tribunal find in Naitahu's favor for all of its claims? And what was the most significant part of the Naitahu land report to you and your group? Please put your questions and feedback um, into the feedback part of the chat. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Kia ora ano. Thank you so much for everyone uh, putting in more questions and comments. I just quickly wanted to get to one that I didn't at the very end before, um, which was discussing how family had heavy involvement in the Waitangi Tribunal. This is from Paul Kilmartin. Um, and that's very true. I didn't want to overemphasize um, that it was only the Naitahu Māori Trust Board. And certainly, as we can see from all of that um, evidence from whānau and from individuals, um, very strongly involved. And certainly the trust was, was active in education and Kalmatua grants as well. Um, and also noted Naitahu Whanui meeting elsewhere, including in Australian cities and Auckland and elsewhere. So kia ora for that. So going on to some of the other comments that have come through. One question, were the hearings that were held recorded at all? Yes, they were. We have audio records of them. And I believe they'll be going up on Kariao if they're not there already. I know most of the record of inquiry, as it's called, that's all of the documents. And uh, that includes research as well as all of the sort of procedural things. And certainly the hearings themselves. There's audio recordings and there's transcripts. Um, there's full transcripts, which are themselves going to be amazing resources for the future. We also have um, some comments and question talking about how uh, they were impressed by the support of other Fano members at the tribunal hearings by their attendance. They were called at the last hearing and a leader pointing um, to the Naitapu flag and that indicating the, that the tribunal had been sitting under this flag and had been recognized by other countries. I didn't know about that. That's really fascinating. Uh, at the first Huyatao post-settlement, various hapu, hapu flags were flown, um, also noting that much of the evidence given was in te reo. Questions about what was the hole in the middle. So that was the claim that Naitahu had never sold the main divide, basically the Alps and going through um, all the center of the country that they had only been sold to the foothills. So that was a key aspect of Tekedeme. And we'll see, despite the fact that the, uh, the tribunal didn't recognize this claim, it was nonetheless still a key part of the settlement. And we'll pick that up um, in a future workshop. Why was the Fjordland claim rejected? Well, there the Crown claimed, uh, the tribunal claimed that because a reserve was requested at Pio Pio Tahi or Milford Sound, if a reserve is requested there, then it couldn't have meant that the entire area would have been um, you know, left out. Because if all of Fjord, Fjordland had been left out, then why would you need a reserve within it? Now, I think the tribunal was can only deal with the evidence in front of it, and, and it didn't have all the evidence there. Um, 
it, it's a bit of a pedantic point on it that if it's already been considered sold, sure, of course, you would ask for a reserve asked afterwards. And just one uh, one final comment here that the tribunal ran with a very strong culpa of Maori approach that the Crown also adhered to from Nicola Potter. Uh, lunch and break times, the Crown and tribunal all went and had kai together. The pain was there, but there was respect and tikanga that went into the process. Both sides had to listen to what each other said, and this approach meant that you were more likely to get a settlement that works for both. Um, kia ora, thank you so much for that comment. It's quite interesting, these days, the tribunal eats separately. Uh, the Crown eats with claimants, but at recent tribunal hearings that I've been in, um, and when I worked, I worked at the Waitangi Tribunal for two years, so I got to work on a couple of inquiries, the, the, the tribunal is completely separate, so it's interesting to see how different it was in those early days. Kia ora, thank you so much for that. Please keep that feedback and questions coming in um, after this next section as well, which we'll turn to now. So we'll focus for this last session here on the three reports that were produced after the Naitahu Land Report. And those three reports, as I mentioned in the intro, were on Naitahu's legal personality, sea fisheries claims, and ancillary claims. The Naitahu legal personality report was easily the tiniest of them all. It was only a handful of pages, but it was still quite important for one day at least, it only occurred about four years later, and once again, we'll explore this in some detail on the workshop about the establishment of Terunaga Onaita. But this little report is something that Naitahu was able to use against the Crown to show the Crown, you need to provide us with this legal personality that we seek. No other iwi or settlement group has received a legal personality legal personality to recognize um, their actual grouping. As you might know, there's legal personality legislation in relation to Te Awatukua, the Whanganui River, and as well as Te Uruwera, which stopped being a national park. But when claimants seek a legal personality for their own post-settlement governance entity, always been rejected. And the argument was, um, from Tiffany O'Regan at the time was that the legal personality of tribes had been destroyed through the land purchases and certainly throughout the North Island, the Ropatu, and native land court uh, processes. And the taking of this legal personality from tribes and instead reverting the power to individuals was one of the most devastating impacts. And I've heard Tatipani mention numerous times that to him, the legal personality legislation was more important than anything else uh, that was you know, negotiated within that settlement. This very tiny report you know, recognized Te Runanga Nui Otahu, which was an incorporated society established in 1990 as a sort of predecessor uh, to Te Runanga Onaitahu. And Basically, in 1990, the Labour government had passed the Iwi Authority Act, which was not providing a legal personality to Iwi, but something very close. And this is repealed by National in 1991 immediately um, for many different reasons. And, and, and we'll touch on those in a bit more detail on the Terunga or Naitahu um, workshop. But this report at least at that time, because the Naitahu Iwi Authority was still in place, um, supported the establishment of that and talked about the trust board as this executive arm and Terunanga Nui as the sort of parliament of Naitahu, which, which I would say Terunanga has become today. 
So it found that Naitahu's claims regarding, re blah, regarding legal personality were well-founded. And it also recognized this 1990 Māori appellate court decision that set Naitahu's boundaries. And that's, as we know them today, to Paranui of Fiti, the White Cliffs on the East Coast, and Kahurangi Point on the West Coast. And this all stemmed from this challenge from the Iwi and Hapu of Te Ihu at the top of the South. And eventually the tribunal referred this on to the Māori Appellate Court, where it can make finding about, findings about tribal boundaries. And here, the Māori Appellate Court very much found in Naitahu's favour and rejected the claims of Te Ihu, arguing in favour of a very hard border between the different groups. Now, this is something that would come under some attack uh, about 16 or 17 years later when tribunal hearings were held in Te Tau Ihu. And there was actually a preliminary report released specifically on these border issues between Ngāi Tahu um, and the Iwi of Te Tau Ihu, which actually um, disagreed with these Māori appellate court decisions. But at this time, very, very strong decision. And obviously important that this report from the Waitangi Tribunal was recognizing it as such. Second, much larger report that's released in 1992 is the Naitahu Sea Fisheries Report. And once again here, the tribunal finds that Naitahu's claims to their sea fisheries are well founded. Now, all of the hearings which take place from 1987 to 1989, they're all of the material from those hearings that's going into these reports. And see, originally the Crown, uh, or sorry, the Waitangi Tribunal didn't want to present these separately. As Naita, who said, their land claims and their sea fishery claims are very much tied in together, as, as we'll see in a second. But it was very much so that the tribunal could try and publish that first report and start those treaty settlement negotiations as quickly as possible. And so you had these separate reports produced for these claims. Amazing evidence produced by the claimants and also by the Crown as well, a whole range. I only listed a few of the Crown researchers there. There was a much longer list, and especially when it came to fisheries. But what was produced was this extensive record of archaeological, written, and oral evidence of Naitahu Sea Fisheries at 1840. This clearly showed and recognized complete Naitahu Rangatiratanga over their sea fisheries, rohe, and resources. And the tribunal was very clear in its emphasis that this didn't just mean that it was only, uh, you know, where Naitahu uh, Fanui went fishing the most intensively, but over their entire rohe and resources. And that it was clear at 1840, Naitahu had been engaged in uh, commercial sales of fish as far as Australia, at Hobart, at Port Jackson, that would eventually become Sydney. So we can see this recognition of this right to sea fisheries, not only on a customary level, but on a commercial level. That the kinds of claims that Naitahu were making were to their rights to the commercial fisheries that existed there. That it wasn't just about only enough um, that was taken day by day, certainly, we have strong evidence that there wasn't a huge depletion of the resource. Certainly by 1840, there was much more of an equilibrium being set um, by Tangata Fenua right across the country, but certainly for Naitahu. So this extensive record, very, very strong. Now at this time, the Crown also condemned, uh, the tribunal condemned the Crown's control of the fishery since the mid 1850s, it regarded this as a flagrant breach of the treaty. And it set out in 
minute detail the series of successive legislation from the 1850s all the way into the 1980s. It also recognized that the valid claims from the nine tall trees, which were reported on in the 1991 report, also influenced these claims of sea fisheries. Because there were individual Naitahu and Naitahu families that had continued fishing on throughout the entire period of the Naitahu claim. But every single one of these families was because that they were also descended from sealing and whaling Pakeha families that had intermarried. And that there had effectively been no tribal fishing enterprises since essentially the 1850s, since shortly after the treaty. And it was as a result of um, Tekereme, as a result of those tiny reserves and a tiny amount of money, that there was zero capital available to continue with these commercial types of fishing. So we can see a strong connection there. Now, there was also a right to the inland fishery recognized out to 12 miles. And in perhaps kind of classic Western fashion, this was only due to the fact that Lieutenant James Cook, not yet a captain, aboard the ship, the Endeavor, bumped into some Naitahu fishers off the Kaikota coast in 1770 when they were doing their circumnavigation. And because of that evidence from Cook and his crew, this is what convinces the courts and the tribunal and eventually the crown that this right to this inland fishery, certainly around the shore, but all the way out to 12 miles. Now the tribunal stated that they may have fished beyond 12 miles, but not very often, uh, and that it would have been perhaps dangerous to the crew, so they wouldn't have do it. Uh, they wouldn't have done it quite as much. Nonetheless, the tribunal still recognized um, Naitahu's treaty right of development in relation to that deep sea fishery between 12 to the 200 mile limit which I believe was established in 1977, um, which creates you know, New Zealand's exclusive economic zone. And the tribunal very specifically also noted that Naitahu's use of the sea fisheries was far more intensive after 1840, even before 1840. Naitahu, Fanui are adapting Western technology for their baits, for their hooks, uh, and eventually into the boats as well, into sealing and certainly into whale boats and using those for these massive fishing expeditions. So very importantly, that treaty right of development was also recognized. And obviously we'll be discussing this in more detail uh, in the next workshop as well. So this is just a little bit of a sneak preview. Now, finally, the Sea Fisheries Report also made findings against the quota management system, echoing the Waitangi Tribunal's Murifenua fishing report for claims from the top of the north. This quota management system created in the mid 1980s established this private property right to fish, right? The creation of these quota. Now, while ostensibly the Crown stated that this was you know, to conserve the fishery because too much fishing was going on, it was a blatant breach of the treaty, creating this fisheries uh, right to fish, this very unique new new property right with any, without any regard for mine. It was clear as day, as we know from our first workshop, that the treaty guaranteed exclusively to Māori all of their fisheries. This is in the English version, not to mention the guarantees of Tino Ranga Tiratanga over all of their Taonga, which certainly included the fisheries resource. An incredibly strong report, and one, as we'll see, that would leave very shortly after its release in August 1992 to the Pan Maori Fisheries Settlement in September 1992. Finally, Let's look at the last report produced as a part of this aspect of the Naitahu claim, the Naitahu Ancillary Claims Report 
1995. These ancillary claims or undergrowth claims of the nine troll trees right across the Rohe, as we can see here in this map from the report, were large, large majority were well-founded by the white secretary. And these ancillary claims were mainly related to these individual and or Fano treaty bridges stemming from various public works and rating legislation and, and different local government legislation as well. And these were for these tiny amount of land that had been reserved to NITA that we've gone through. And we just actually mentioned in that previous um, slide, right? They only reserved about one, one, thousandth of the land that was purchased and you would expect that the least that the crown could have done at this point was to ensure that the vestiges of the tribal estate these tiny tiny vestiges would at least be protected from alienation but the evidence that was provided to the white Sanya tribunal was clear that oftentimes maori land would be targeted over that of general land held by pakeha or even crown land to be used for roading, to be used for schools, to be used for airports, to be used for all types of even sewage systems, quite disgustingly, as, as we know from the case for Ihutai at the Avon Heathcote estuary. Now, these claims were reported on regionally, as you can see. You had a couple of claims in Kaikota, uh, a number in Canterbury a nearly a majority actually on Tsitsipotsini on the west coast in Arahuda um, and further south of Arahuda, um, Murihiku, Rakyura, and Otago. Not all the claims were reported on, but a very uh, large majority were, and a very large majority were found uh, in the favor of the claimants. And this would eventually influence the provision of redress for ancillary claims as part of the settlement. That was meant to be the return of specific lands to the descendants um, of those who had originally you know, received these reserves as we can see set out across these maps. Not the easiest job to do. I'm unsure if all the lands still to this day have been returned. We'll talk a little about, bit about that when it comes to the settlement. But certainly the ancillary claims report, rather than the big picture sort of macro level of the land purchases, reported on the very specific claims of these fauna and individuals. And were obviously an incredibly important aspect of the resolution of Te Keremi. So we'll break out for our last session here. We'll have about 10 minutes and we'll report back um, some of your questions and comments. Thank you so much, keep them coming through. Please remember to turn on your mics and, um, and your cameras. So what were the legal personality and sea fishery reports about? Why were they so important? And what kind of claims were reported on in the ancillary claims report? And why were they so central to the claims of individuals and fauna? Kyoto, and we'll see you soon. Kyoto, I know. So please do get some of that feedback um, through for this last session, talking about those legal personality and sea fisheries claims. So we have. Paul Kilmartin um, recalling a case that was taken to the Privy Council where we may have lost some quota for Scampi, given that some companies argue they couldn't gain quota during the moratorium. That is, there was a moratorium put on the release of quota due to all of these court cases. And also mention about one remaining ancillary claim on the Otago Peninsula is still to be settled, coming from land taken in the 1850s. Now, question, what did the fishing management system look like around about 1770 with an eye to sustainability? Were fish taken in certain seasons and overfishing avoided? 
there's not a ton of evidence. I should, I'm not a fisheries expert. I should definitely qualify any response you get from me about that. But in terms of what we know at 1770 is largely through any oral evidence that had been passed down perhaps into written form in the 19th century or archeological evidence. Um, and there are certain, uh, you know, it's the middens. It's basically what kind of um, rubbish you have left over from, you know, the fish that were consumed that we can start to piece together how it was done. Um, far, for, far, far more knowledgeable um, than me or, or the researchers that fed into it. So I'm, I'm, I wouldn't want to say that I could say um, which fish were taken in which seasons, but it is generally accepted that in this relatively late period that overfishing was certainly avoided. And the population basis wasn't... Um, that large here as well. The tribunal noted that, that that would have prevented some overfishing too. So Kilda, thank you, Paul, for your, for your questions and comments. Why have other iwi been denied legal personality um, from John to Young? I'm not 100% sure. I know that when Christopher Finlayson, who as we'll see, you know, was a Naita who, um, part of our Naita who legal advisory team, during the settlement negotiations. He later becomes the Minister of Treaty Negotiations from 2008 to 2017 in those John Key um, Bill English governments. When anybody sought legal personality, it was 100% denied. As to why, I mean, perhaps the amount of legal power that comes with this the liabilities that might be created for the crown, it's usually the crown law office is focused on limiting its legal liabilities. And we'll see when we get to the lecture, um, the workshop about the establishment of Terunaga or Naitahu, the inclusion of any sense of any kind of rangatiratanga, which is evident in this provision of legal personality. Um, to me, <laughs> it must be valuable because the crown denied it. I don't know exactly why, what was scaring it in that sense, but I've always said, if the crown doesn't want to give it to you, or you want to be getting that. So it's, it's something still to be determined and we'll come back to it in, in a future workshop. Um, from Nicola Potter talking about Naita who having Tino Rangatirata Tanga going way back. Um, fascinating to hear about Cook running into Naita who fishers. And the group discussed how this was Naitahu's wish for Tino Rangatiratanga, and that's exactly that. Certainly, the ancillary claims are not all settled. There are a whole lot on the coast around Bruce Bay, and these are causing delays for those Fano who are waiting for succession claims, and that, that is also what I've heard, unfortunately. Mark Scott's group discussed the relationship with the reports and tribunal findings. Um, and yes, we'll have a number of workshops on the treaty settlement. Just very quickly, you had one final question um, from Sue, Kyoda Sue, to explain the legal personality decision. It was basically the tribunal recognizing that Naita, whose rights to exist as a tribe on a legal level, were something that was destroyed through the land purchases. The argument was that legal personalities of all tribes were destroyed through colonization. And this has prevented them, perhaps in somewhat of a Western sense, from taking, um, taking on the crown as this entire legal person. Legal personality is basically tied up very much in American ideas of that corporations are people. And that might sound messed up when applied to this idea of Naitahu as an iwi, but it's something that is incredibly powerful within our Western system. I hope I've explained a little bit of that. I promise we will get into it in more detail in the workshops to come. Uh, so kia ora everyone, thank you so much uh, for participating and being involved in our fourth workshop as a part of this series.
Next workshop will be held on the 9th of June, 2022, from 10.30 to 12.30 p.m. as usual. And this one will be looking at Naitahu and the fisheries settlement. The registration link will be sent out next week. And you won't be with me. Um, you will also, uh, you will actually have uh, Tatipani O'Regan, David Higgins, uh, and Craig Ellison uh, with uh, Rakahia uh, having a bit of a panel discussion about the fisheries settlement. So we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, thank you and kakite. Kia tau, kia tātou katoa, te atawhai o tō tātou āriki a Ihirukraiti me te aroha o te atua, me te fifinga tahitanga o te wairua tapu. Ake, ake, ake. Amen.